Господин.
we will only care about the first three. That's reflexive symmetric and transitive. And we have a definition. If R is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, then we call R an equivalence relation. Why? Because it reminds us of the equal sign. The equal sign is an operation that is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And so we can think of uh, an equivalence relation as some sort of generalization on the equal sign. Right? How can we use the equal sign in larger contexts? And the equivalence relation is the answer. And it's a very useful um, characterization to have. So we're going to spend some time on this now, now that we know that. Say R is defined on the real numbers such that A R B if and only if A is equal to B. But R B on the set of the integers where we have A R B if and only if A plus B is odd. Um, what if we change that to even? Since 
if a is equal to b, then b is equal to a. Three, <coughs> r is transitive since if a equals b and b equals c, then a equals c. The above follow by the definition of the equal sign in the real number axioms, which when we get to the second book, we'll talk about those. Right, so there are a bunch of axioms that define the set of the real numbers, and in that in that set of axioms, you have something called the equal sign, and it defines the properties of the equal sign, and these kind of follow directly from the axioms. So that was kind of silly, but it is something that we want to make sure is true. If we're going to call something an equivalence relation, we think that the equal sign should be. What about B? Do you think it's an equivalence relation? Uh, no. So it is it's a self reflexive right. If A is R, then R plus R is even. Right, so check reflexive. Check of reflexivity. Um, so, assume A is odd, then A is equal to 2K plus 1 for some integer K, then if I take A plus A, this gives us 2A, which is of course going to be 2 times 2K plus 1, which is even. Right. So this means A does not relate to itself which means R is not reflexive, which means R is not an equivalence relation. We don't need to check anymore because it has to have all three properties to be an equivalence relation, and if it doesn't have any one property, it's not an equivalence relation. This one was an equivalence relation. Here you can just do a little examination that is not an equivalence relation. You need to give a counterexample if you want. Um, what about being even though? Yes. So I create a relation on the set of integers where I say one thing relates to another thing. If when I add them, I get an even integer. Since a plus a is 2a, which is even, since a is in z, r is reflexive. Okay, so reflexivity work out. What about symmetry? Okay, go. How would I do symmetry? A and B are even numbers. A plus B. How do we carry it? How is the relation defined? Uh, by the. I, I'm saying A, R, A, if A, A, R, B, if A plus B is even. This is the definition. So symmetry means I have to. If they switch roles, then the claim still holds, right? If my A swaps with B. So what should my first thing be? B plus A. Huh? B plus A. No, but my assumption, what is my first thing? Oh, it must be even. It must be even. It's even. That's going to be your first assumption. 
since a plus b is equal to b plus a, we have b plus a is even. And so a relates to b would imply that b relates to a. So r is symmetric. What about transitive? Let me introduce a new notion at this point. The notion of an equivalence class. So here's, here's one way we can do it. Suppose in the above example. We want to group elements that relate to each other. In sets. So let's actually start creating sets where things will relate to each other under this group, under this definition. Um, so So let's ask ourselves, what set would say zero belong to? So if I get, get I start doing this kind of exercise, I would be able to say zero belong to which set if I create 
create my sets based on this characterization. Who are all the guys that relate to zero under this relation? Which what? The set of all real numbers? Or are you talking about which specific of those? This specific example, example C. Right. A R B if A plus B is even. Any even numbers. Okay, how did you how did you get to that? Uh, I want to see Okay, so how do you express that? All x in A. All x in, which are A here is the integers, all x in Z such that. X such that x relates to 0. So that x relates to 0. Which is basically. i.e., that same. X plus 2k. X plus 0 is 2k for k and z. Or that is x plus 0 is even. Right? Now, what list of things would fit that bit? Well, of course, 0 itself, right? because it's reflexive. So 0 itself has to be in there. Um, but what else? Well, adding 0 to anything just gives you the thing. So you can really see here at this point that anything that is itself even is going to work. So 2 would work, you notice that 0 plus 2 is even, 4 would work, 0 plus 4 is even, 6 would work, 0 plus 6 is even. This would work with pluses and minuses, by the way. So we would end up with this set. We'll basically get a set of even integers. Okay. But there are elements missing, of course, so let's actually create another set. Look at the first guy that we missed here. <coughs> First, <laughs> can put some sort of order. Let's look at where one would live. Right? So clearly, one would fit with itself because that is reflexive. But who else? I need to find all the people who relate to one under this relation. Notice that this is just a set of all x in z such that x plus one is e. Same with the all odd numbers. This would be 1 itself. If you had 1 plus 3, you would get 4, which is even. 1 plus um, 5, you would get 6, which is even, and so on. Notice that this will also work with the negatives. 1 minus 1 is 0, which is even. 1 minus 3 is minus 2, which is even. 1 minus 5 is minus 4, which is even. You'll end up with here a set of odd integers. Let's formalize this a little bit. Let R be an equivalence relation. Uh, if 
won't actually matter. Why wouldn't it actually matter? Or rather, it's symmetric. Huh? It's symmetric. So me writing A relates to B, it would imply that B relates to A. So you can define it in any order you want. Because this, this, this notion is only defined for equivalence relations. So we can assume that this guy is a reflexive symmetric and transitive. And we can put things into classes. And this is the notation that we use for the classes. These are called Kohler's classes. Okay. Here are some facts about Kohler's classes. Tell me some things that you notice about these two classes. What can you tell me? What? What do you mean some all? Both sets. The the union union sets. Well, the union of both sets will give you everyone, right? So it turns out that one fact that you need to know, it's even a theorem, by the way, in your textbook, is that equivalence classes on a partition A. You can know, take this as a theorem. Right? An equivalence class on a set, if you put an equivalence relation on a set and then find all its equivalence classes, if you take the union of all equivalence classes, you will get the set A, i.e., the union of all equivalence classes. Equivalence class. 
A. The, the, the element A itself It's called an equivalence class representative. Right? He just represents an equivalence class, and it's just you can pick that guy at random. Like me writing down any one of these guys would have sufficed for me writing down zero. I can choose at random who I would like to show as the representative of this set. Pretty much any one of these even integers, I could have written them here and say well, that's the same equivalence class. So the guy that I put in here, they're just representing this set, and I call them equivalence class representatives. Right? There is no right or wrong answer for you to put in here as long as the guy you put in here is coming from that set. So we can represent our equivalence classes by taking any one guy in that equivalence class and putting brackets around it, and that will denote the set of all such things that relate to that guy under the relation we consider. Okay, so... How do you go about proving this? I'm going to call this theorem 1 and theorem 2. I think it's easier to prove this and we can use that to help us prove this. Uh, 
using the definitions. Uh, okay, tell me how to do it. So let's say that uh, giving some x. A is related to C for some x, right? And then okay. So assume A relates to C. Yeah, I use different words, but um, mm -hmm. the second one you can say that since it's an equivalence relation, it's like it's transit. It's something flexible. This means that C is related to A. It means C is related to A. Okay. And then you want to use the transit to be equal somewhere. Could you have used the same C instead of D and then use transitive to show? I think that's. Was that what you're Yeah, I used to Yeah, a, so a, what A relates to C means. So that means that C is an element of A. But then that would also mean that C. That would also mean that C is an element of B because they're equal. So this relationship holds, which means that C also relates to B, right? Then, how do I get that A relates to B? Uh, since it's transitive, B relates to C. Then, since R, R is since transitive, A relates to C, and C relates to B would imply that A relates to B. So we have the forward implication. Uh, for something like that, would you even have to mention that C relates to B implies C, uh, B relates to C, or can you just? No. The, well, what do you mean? Why do we need that? Why would we need to say B relates to C here? I want to use transit, oh, yeah, so I want the yeah, interface to be the same. So the other guy's face. For the converse. What would I say? So A raise B. So I want to do a direct proof here. Assume A relates to B. Symmetric? 
So here's where I use my symmetry. To show that B would be in A, but can you not argue that that also implies that A would be in B? Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm asking. What is the missing link here? Because we didn't actually show that. I, we never actually made the statement that A is in B, right? How can I get to the statement? You're supposing A relates to B, right? So then that would mean that B is the... Right. This guy follows, since A R B would mean that A is also in this guy. Since it relates to B. The other inclusion is going to follow similar. Try to prove the second theorem. You can use this guy to help you. That uh, equivalence classes partition the set. Basically, what you want to show is that the equivalence classes will, their unions will make up the entire set, and they will have to be disjoint. Which means if two guys are members of different equivalence classes, then no member of any, either equivalence class will be a member of the other one. You can do that by contradiction. I think your book proves that. But I would recommend that you try to prove it without. So equivalence classes are nice. Um, there's actually another theorem that's even stronger than this. Let A be a set and P be any partition. Of the set. Then, so P is just a set of subsets non-empty subsets of A, such that when you take their union, you get all of A, and all the sets are disjoint, then there exists an equivalence relation R such that there exists an equivalence relation R on A that the equivalence classes are precisely the elements of the partition. Which is pretty cool. So this is saying if I have a set and I slap an equivalence relation on it, that equivalence relation is going to dissect the set into disjoint subgroups, subsets, right? Where they are all non-empty and none of them will intersect with each other. And when I take their union, I get the entire set. It is also the case that if I have a set and you give me a random partition of that set, I can find an equivalence relation that will break up into those equivalence classes after the fact, right? So it's a very strong thing, equivalence classes. And your book, uh, I think, gives an, well, it only makes sense, I think, to just give an existence proof of it, just construct an equivalence relation. And the relation they would be is something like, A relates to B if they happen to be in the same set of the given partition. You can prove that that is an equivalence relation.
And because of the idea of equivalence classes and we can use representatives to represent equivalence classes, you kind of end up in the situation where some guys are just interchangeable with other guys, right? And you, you don't have to care who you're specifically talking about. We, we already kind of have this notion on the real numbers, right? There are, you can split up the real numbers into partitions um, depending on their decimal expansions, for example. So if someone writes a half and someone writes 0.5, and someone writes 0 0.500, or someone writes 2 over 4, or blah, blah, blah. We all know these as the same guy, right? A, a new way to think about this is to just say all these representations live in the equivalence classes that we can put on the real numbers, right? So the representative doesn't matter. I can, use, I can represent the number 1 half in an infinite number of ways, but they're all the same. You can all think of them as the same. So we have this consistency of notation going on, and it's thanks to this idea of equivalence relations. So these guys are just representatives of what it means to be the number, the real number, one half. So you can't really say, you know, this guy's a half and that guy's not. No, they're all representing the same idea, the same notion, the same quantity. You can just call it by a different name, but it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It just represents that point on the number line. And I can represent it in a lot of ways. There's a lot of power to being able to do that. In this class, we're not going to see all the um, nice things that come from that. But we are going to see some things that is nice, which I think is going to be in this section. This congruence my end. So this is another thing that we've already seen before in this idea, um, and here's how it's going to start. Um, let n be an integer where n is greater than 2, define r on z by a relates to b if and only if A is equivalent to B on N. It turns out R is an equivalence relation. So we're proof here. This was a test question, right? I gave you a specific number for the test. Oh. Yeah, so on the bonus on the test, I said, Prove that A is equivalent to B if A, prove that it's an equivalence relation if A or B, if and only if A equivalent to B mod 3. But it turns out this will be true for any N greater than or equal to 2. So let's actually just prove that. 1. Since A minus A is equal to 0, which is 0 times N, a is equivalent to A mod N. So R is reflexive here. Two. If we assume that A is equivalent to B mod N, then what does that mean? B minus A is equal to N divides the difference. A minus B is N times some integer. But this means B minus A is just N times some other integer, which means that B relates is equivalent to A mod N. So R is symmetric. Three. If we assume that A is equivalent to B mod N and C is equivalent to B is equivalent to C mod N, then I need to be able to say that A is equivalent to C mod N. K. Equal to n times k. And b minus c. b 
minus so c m times k. And m. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the n is the value oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. n times l for k l in z. And k l in Then summing these a minus c, a minus c. is add them together. A minus c is going to be n times k, k minus l, l. Which means that a is equivalent to c minus so R is transitive. And you can expect similar problems like these on the next exam, where I'm going to give you some relation, and I'm going to ask you to prove that this is an equivalence relation, or maybe prove it's not an equivalence relation. So you need to know the definition of what it means to be an equivalence relation, and you need to go through using the definition I gave you, and show that elements relate to themselves, if anyone relates to someone else, they relate to the other guy, and so this is talking about congruence. Turns out that the congruence relationship that we spoke about earlier is actually an equivalence relation on the set of integers. Meaning, I can think of one integer as equivalent to another mod n. And so that's why this symbol here, the use of that symbol is justified because that's an equivalent symbol. It actually re represents an equivalence relation. So it's, you can't really say a equals b because that symbol on the real numbers usually means they're exactly the same guy. But I can't say they're equivalent in some sense. I, so I can have different representatives here, but they're kind of the same, they represent the same idea. In terms of mod n, they're you no know, different, right? It's kind of like a half versus 0.5. They're the same guy, it doesn't matter what it looks like, right? They are related to each other, and they are equivalent in some notion. So we can define equivalence in terms of the remainder when dividing by some integer at n, and that's an equivalence relation. Um, so let's see, I have two examples I want to do here. Say n equals 4. Just to give you an explicit example, what are the equivalence classes here? So n equals 4. I'm going to go to this relationship. I'm going to plug in n equals 4, which is greater than or equal to 2. So I know a equivalent to b mod 4 is actually an equivalence relation. I want to know what are the equivalence classes. We know this is an equivalence class by the above. How do we go about finding them? Yeah, you pick a random element and try to find all the people who relate to it. So, okay, let's find the equivalence class of zero. And you're going to write down all, this, all the integers such that um, zero relates to that integer. Or, i.e., zero is equivalent to b mod 4. from that set that you just constructed. So you want to obviously zero itself is in there. So notice you jump from zero to plus four. So who do I miss? I miss one, two, and three. So pick the first guy that I miss, like one. Find out who he relates to. Obviously he relates to himself. Who else would he relate to? Right, because I can say one minus one is zero. That's the 
by 4. 5 minus 1 is 4, that's divisible by 4. 9 minus 1 is 8, that's divisible by 4. Give me some negative numbers. Minus 3. Minus 3. Minus 7. Seven. Minus 7. <laughs> All right, you, you can kind of see the pattern here, they're skipping by 4. You can also go then to the equivalent class of 2, and you realize that that 2 itself is in there, but also with 6 would be in there, 10 would be in there, 14 would be in there. If you look at some negatives, minus 2 would be in there, minus uh, 4, 6 would be in there, minus 10 would be in there, da da da. And I can look at the equivalence class of 3.
that has all sorts of implications as well. But let's actually do another example. So this is an equivalence relation. And find its equivalence classes. So if I had a plus 3b, it's equivalent to 0 mod 4. This is, I claim this is an equivalence relation. Proof. Some more practice. Let's go. What's the first one? Reflexive. We need to show it's reflexive. So, how do I do that? Start with meaning Z. Okay. <coughs> then say that A plus 3B is equal to A plus 3. You're plugging in. So a plus 3a is equal to 4a, which is obviously equivalent to 0 mod 4, since it's a multiple of 4. So a relates to a under this relation. 2, symmetry. What can I assume? Let's just start this by saying let a, b, c, b, and the others. So you don't have to keep writing that. Symmetry. What do I need to show? Well, we know that a plus 3b is um, common to 0 mod 4. Yeah, I assume that a plus 3b equals 0 mod 4. So, in other words, we're going to assume that a relates to b, i.e. <coughs> a plus 3b is equivalent to 0 mod 4. What do I need to show? That is b plus 3a also. We need to show that B relates to A. In other words, what do I need to show? B plus 3A. B plus 3A must also be equivalent to mod 4. Right? How would I obtain this result? So, A plus 3B is equal to some A. A plus 3B equals 4A. For K and Z. And then uh, you could, I guess, solve for either A or B. A would probably be easier, and then you solve for B. Yeah, solve for A. This would mean that A is equal to 4K minus 3B. And then plug it in. Plug it into what? Uh, plug B plus 3A. Okay, so I want to be able to say something about B plus 3A. So I went to the first one. I solved for A. And now let's plug it in. This would mean that if I look at b plus 3a, this would give me b plus 3 times 4k minus 3b. This would be, if I multiply that out, that's minus 9b plus b, that's minus 8b plus all 12k. You can factor out 4. You can factor out 4, that's minus 2b plus 3k. So that's actually equivalent to 0 mod 4. Alright, this is symmetric. One transitivity. Um, a plus 3b is equivalent to 0 mod 4. Assume a plus 3b is equivalent to 0 mod 4 and b plus 
and c plus 3c through c is equal to 0 mod 4. And then a plus 3b is equal to 4 times k. And b plus 3c is equal to 4 times l times l.
to define the following. Z and write a little n down at the bottom to be this set. Zero, one, two, all the way up to n minus one, where this guy is just a set of all functions <coughs> on it, of all b in z such that a is equivalent to b mod n. So we can have examples here. Example, we can have z2, that will just be 0 and 1. That will just have two things in it. Right? I can do z mod 4, that would have 0, 1, 2, 3. That would stop. Right? So that's kind of like z. This is called z mod n or the integers mod n, right? So it's just a set where the elements of this set are the equivalence classes as defined by modular. Now we won't be able to prove this all in full today, but for those of you who are in my linear algebra class, this is one of the simplest ways to actually construct fields that are not the real numbers. It turns out that if your n is a prime integer, you can prove that that set, even though it has a finite number of elements, it will have all the properties that the real numbers have. You will have some notion of division that's defined, you have distributive laws, commutative laws, associativity laws, you have a, a multiplicative inverse, an additive inverse, multiplicative identity, and additive identity. The set will behave like a set of real numbers, and we so we can take them as a field. And so, when we get to the next book, a lot of ever, everyone will actually know what that is, what a field is. The real numbers is a set called a field. But for those of you who are also in my linear algebra class, you could, if you wanted to create a finite field where your scalars are only a finite set of elements, not like all the real numbers. We can actually create them with Z mod n. So with that, if you look at ones and zeros in a computer science context, make this guy the field, you can call the, the set 0, 1 over Z2 would actually be a vector space. Because Z2 function is a Get ahead of ourselves. Let's actually move on to this. Let's look at some properties of Z mod n. Very, very, very important set. And in abstract algebra, you will learn a lot more about it. Um, but the idea is it, we can create a whole number system of guys that look like this with some defined operations. And in the case that this guy is going to be prime, we, can be, we will be able to show that that is actually going to behave just like the real numbers. Um, if that's not prime, it turns out it won't behave like the real numbers. So something like division could not be defined. You'll have things like when I multiply two things, if I get zero, then one or the other does not have to be zero. You'll have all sorts of weird things happening when n is not prime. So let's define operations on this. in 
a new context where it works on the cloud version. Yeah. Uh, the plus in this context be almost sort of similar to like a union. Or no, I guess not really. Well, we'll we'll see. Uh, I'm actually going to write out some tables. Right? Because it turns out we'll always have a finite amount of answers here in some weird sense. Next time we're going to talk about the notion of well-defined. Next time we'll prove that these next time. We'll prove these are well-defined. Because if you're going to perform an operation on sets of things where you're trying to get them to behave like a number system, you better make sure that your definition actually works in all contexts. Right? Because not all operations like that would work in every context, right? So for example, I can say define uh, plus on Q such that if I take A over B, plus C over D. Let's say there's some context in which I want to just ignore the denominators and add the tops. Right? It turns out that that operation could not work. It wouldn't make any sense. And why would that be? Well, right. Let's say I add a half and a half. What would the answer be according to this operation? Two. Two. But let's say I had a half and 2 over 4, which we know is the same thing. What would that give us? 3. three. So you see, just us randomly defining something that seems to make sense, yeah. it doesn't always make sense. So this is going to be an important thing to know. That this random operation just defined it makes sense, it will work, regardless of what representative you can use. When you say, when you say that our operation does not depend on the representative, we call such an operation well-defined, and I'm going to prove that it's well-defined next time. For now, but I, I just want you to be aware that any random rule that we come up with might not make sense in a numbers in a number system context. But these will make sense in that context. We'll prove that next time. For now, I just want to actually go through and define. For now, I want to define some. How you get used to looking at this by using some tables. For now, we write plus and times tables for zu z mod 3 and z mod 4. So we know that the elements of z mod 3 are 0, 1, Right. 
Now that would tell you that that's three, but three is not a guy in our set. So I put three is just a representative of one of the guys in our set. I don't have to write it as specifically three. I just write who is equivalent to. Now remember, Z mod three is just a set of all things that are congruent to this guy mod three, but three is congruent to zero mod three. So this actually gives us zero. Doing here, according to this definition, 2 plus 0, that's 2. According to this definition, this would be 2 plus 1. Notice that that's 3. 3 is not a, three is not a representative here, but understand that 3 is this guy, so that would also give us 0. Here I would have 2 plus 2, so technically that gives us 4. But 4 is equivalent to 1 mod 3, so that's 1. So that would be the addition table according to this according to these operations and according to this set. 0 plus 0 is 0, and I can say that 2 plus 2 is actually 1. That's kind of like we have a clock that it stops at 3, and then it goes to 1 after that. Um, what about the multiplication tables for Z mod 3? Zero times zero? Zero. Zero. Zero times one is zero. Zero times two is zero. Okay, that's it. Zero times this is zero. Zero times anything is going to be zero, so those guys are all going to be zero. One times one is one. One. Two. Um, one times two is two. One times two is two. Here, if I take two times two, I would get four. And four is what? One. Four goes back to one. That's how we that's how we add and multiply in Z mod 3. Do the same thing for Z mod 4. <laughs> yeah, 2 plus 2 is not 4. It's not. Okay, so let's look at Z mod 4. In the real numbers, that doesn't work, of 
numbers, right? And the real numbers, if you have a product of things giving you zero, then each individual term must also be zero. So it turns out that this guy could not function as a number system to the extent that the real numbers can function. Because multiplication behaves where division is automatically going to behave, where it turns out that there will be no notion of division on this set. You'll realize, though, that that does not happen here. Right? If I have two things that I multiply and they're not zero, I will not get zero. Right? One times one, one times two, or two times two. Like, no one, if I have the both elements not being zero, I would not get zero when I multiply. Um, we can also talk about the notion of uh, multiplicative inverse, right? Which is kind of like di division, right? So, if I have a guy here, given a random guy, like a two, for example, does there exist something like a two inverse? In the sense that when I multiply 2 by this thing, I will get 1. Yes, 2 itself is its own inverse. Turns out that 2 times 2 is equal to 1. Right? Notice that 1 also has an inverse. In fact, it's itself. Um, that's the, I only require the non-zero numbers to have an inverse, but every non-zero number here has an inverse, which means I can define division on this set. Right? Because all non-zero numbers, I can divide by them. Right? There's a, a notion of division here. Um, you can go, you can play around with this with a couple larger sets if you want. You can do Z mod 5. You notice that Z mod 5 would behave like this way. You will never be able to multiply two things and get zero if the individuals aren't zero. You will be able to find an inverse for every element. You'll be able to find an additive inverse for every element as well. And you would realize that this can actually function like a number system. You can go look up all the properties of the real numbers, and you can go through all those properties, and you can show that this set will fit all of them. Z5 will fit all of them. Z7 will fit all of them. Z11 will fit all of them. Whereas something like Z4 will not fit all of them. It's a very, very important set to do, especially if, you, if you're a math major and you're going on to uh, figure out better things. In abstract algebra, you're going to do a lot of work with guys like this, and we'll actually come back to that later as well. Uh, we'll stop there for now. I do want to say... I want to say a bit more, but... I don't think you need to know that for the homework. So let's actually do the homework for this. The other thing that I want to say is just for your general education, proving it's well defined and stuff. So homework, this is for chapter 8. Do you want to do it? I'll say a couple more things like. Do you mean Tuesday? Tuesday. Which is the. What date?